thank you very very much for your very kind introduction uh, and i would like to thank uh, uh, the organizers of this meeting especially uh, dr abhishek for inviting me to uh, to present uh, some of our work in this group um, so i uh, my group has diverse interests um, generally um, uh, coming under the broad umbrella of understanding the complex relationship between amino acid sequences uh, three dimensional structures the functions and interaction properties of proteins uh, and uh, but you know however in today's talk uh, uh, i have uh, chosen something which is uh, uh, quite close to my heart uh, it has been going on for the last several years uh, but i'm going to present the most salient aspects of this work and the work is titled bridging the islands of protein families in sequence space using artificial sequences um so uh, you know uh, the next slide uh, um, yeah, i hope you, you you are all able to see my slides full screen right okay the slide you are now seeing is very very old data i think it's an embo journal paper by chris sander and coworkers in 1992 um that was the time when the genome sequencing uh, was being initiated a uh, very exciting time uh, and uh, um, th they have published uh, the information on the functions of the uh, of the open reading frames in the yeast chromosome 3 and uh, um, it is shown as a pie chart um so um uh, you know there are for example this blue region the dark blue region covers uh, um uh, uh, i mean it says that there are 23% of the coded proteins um that have the homolog um uh, which are probably very well studied the homolog from other uh, other organisms so you have a good idea about um, um the function uh, what i mean by the homolog is that the proteins that are believed to be evolved from common ancestry so therefore uh, they they share the overall three dimensional structure and most of the time uh, um, uh, to a large extent the functional properties and this sky blue shows a small proportion of proteins for which um, the experimental uh, uh, experimentally determined function is available there are transmembranous and composition bias proteins and there are also about 14% of the proteins for which uh, you have the homolog information with known function and also known structure so one can have a better appreciation of uh, how um, the protein actually works from three dimensional uh, structure and the the point of this slide is this large proportion of 37% which are shown in uh, blood red which are probably global proteins but nobody has any idea about the function so now this is 1992 data so how is it today it is only i think the red region is slightly diminished um, and now uh, but even if you take uh, a very commonly studied um, uh, uh, you know uh, the model organism genome of a model organism like e coli there is still substantial proportion of um, the open reading frames uh, i mean uh, the gene uh, the protein coding regions for which uh, uh, nobody in the world knows still the functions of uh, of those proteins so um, this is a problem uh, that is older than my my age i think <laughs> um, uh, to find um, uh, to to i mean to get the first impression of the um, function of a protein by uh, by identifying the homologous proteins uh, so um, during the divergent evolution of proteins the the structures and functions are reasonably well conserved even if the function is not completely conserved the nature of the function is such that there is a great similarity you can't quantify the function similarity anyway um, so um, so you know therefore um, in order to get uh, some idea about what the protein might be doing in the cell um, what is the function um, the first and most attractive uh, 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 i mean the question to ask is that what are its homologs so you know you, you tell about your family i will tell about you or uh, you tell about your friends i tell about you it's you know same sort of thing um, you uh, you know once um, you uh, you know you have a protein of um, your interest for which you want to identify the function and other features 
there are many many features of uh, of the protein wherein the cell it works where is subcellular localization does it undergo any post translational modification what are the other proteins it interacts with there are so many questions i cover all of this in the broad theme of function um, which is a, a sort of a very loosely used term here and uh, um, so um, so you know basically uh, um, one um, queries a protein sequence in a database uh, of protein sequences and then you identify the hits it's a string matching here every protein in the you know in the database is represented as but the uh, the sequence is represented as a single letter code of amino acids and it's a string matching between the query sequence and uh, the sequences in the database and then you use certain criteria to uh, call something as hits and once you have hits and you can align the uh, sequences and then identify um, uh, whether the functional residues are conserved if they are conserved then uh, you get a, a very reasonable uh, i mean the first idea about the function of the query protein so um, uh, you know this is the um, okay there, there's no i mean what is the problem about this you know this has been done this is being done uh, you know for almost last 60 70 years now um, blast sort of programs do it uh, they have um, uh, and uh, others do little they are all pioneers uh, they have told us how to recognize the homologs but um, uh, you know I, 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 until um, the protein structural science developed into a reasonable shape we did not realize in in those in those uh, 50s and 60s when protein structures were not available uh, that the problem uh, is still even in 2020 is far from being solved um, but what you see in this slide is um, um, the you know that there's um, a central paradigm of molecular biology from uh, the gene um, gene sequence that is base sequences of genes um, uh, which code for proteins you can uh, work out the amino acid sequence of course and uh, christian and finson and co-workers told that amino acid sequence determines the three-dimensional structure of the protein and how the three-dimensional structure is uh, uh, is um, is you know, disposed um, it, it has a profound influence in uh, in the understanding of how proteins work in the cell so uh, but you know due to um, uh, the redundancy in the genetic code uh, you can have base sequences uh, can be you know uh, changing more rapidly than amino acid sequences amino acid sequences are moderate variability and 3d structures are extremely uh, robust um, they can tolerate substantial uh, uh, changes uh, very significant changes in amino acid uh, sequences also and still maintain three dimensional structure uh, so um, the, so the 3d structures are least variable so the, now the problem is uh, during the divergent evolution when the amino acid sequences diverge from each other uh, sometimes they they would diverge um, uh, in such a way enormously in such a way that when you align those sequences they don't look similar at all uh, suppose you align myoglobin sequence with ribonuclease sequence, you know, completely underrated proteins, the kind of similarity you will get, that's this kind of similarity you might face between the two related proteins also, uh, when the divergence in evolution is enormous. So, um, so I, I'm showing a picture here, four in one protein uh, picture, and those percentages indicate the sequence identity among themselves. So the bottom two are uh, very, very closely related. These are, uh, you know, the 90%. But everything else, 15, 12, 14%. You know, if you generate random sequences in the computer and make random alignments large number of times and you calculate the sequence identity, you will get a range of, of something like 2 to 3%, all the way up to 20, 22%. So um, any number in this range is same as, uh, uh, you know, uh, same as random. So this 14%, 12%, you can also get such sequence identities between two proteins, which are doing completely different functions. They also look in three dimensions completely differently. So these numbers don't mean anything. Now, um, uh, but the, now I will name these proteins. 
So the left top bottom is triphosphate isomerase, and the other three are uh, they are in the fam general family of aldolases. So um, the right top is metal dependent, and uh, and then the bottom two are not uh, they are they are you know metal independent aldolases. Therefore, they are called as class one. All of them fold in the same way, as you can appreciate from this cartoon representation. And uh, um, so, although the sequence identity between uh, that you know for the human and rabbit with the E. coli bacterial counterpart is extremely low, like I think twelve percent or something, um, they perform very similar functions. So, um, I, I, you know, uh, if you you know overlay. Uh, the, the the 3D structures, and then ask the question: Where the functional sites lie in the two in the two proteins? Suppose you overlay human um, uh, human aldolase with the E. coli aldolase, the functional sites overlap very nicely. Um, although the sequence identity is quite low, within those conserved residues, you have the functionally uh, sensitive residues. Active, active site residues are all conserved. So um, although the uh, I mean uh, the diverge, they have you know, diverged enormously during the evolution. Um, they maintain the 3D structure, and then they completely conserve the functional uh, residues. Suppose, um, uh, suppose uh, you, know, um, you know, before the structure and function of the human aldolase is uh, known, when you just had human genome sequence, if you had recognized that it is related to the aldolase of E. coli, some more, only from sequence information, you could have recognized the function uh, that it is actually, it could be an aldolase based on conservation of functional residues. So that is the whole uh, spirit of the matter. And you know, the ordinary blast and fast they are wonderful, but they cannot uh, uh, recognize such extreme sequence divergence uh, cases. Uh, and if you, are, if you are able to uh, come up with uh, new methods and new approaches, that will allow you to identify very distant homologs. And then uh, what you can do is uh, um, you can use it as the, uh, as a, uh, um, as an important uh, uh, hold in order to recognize the function. So unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the size of the unknown in, from the genomic data is still quite high for most genomes. And then it is growing by the day because Lots and lots of genomes are sequenced every day. And then the, that, you know, the X, the unknown, is increasing by the day. So it is very, uh, uh, it's a sort of a desperate situation to identify uh, the distant relationships and see if you can improve those things. So during the talk, I will use the word uh, family if the sequence identity between homologs is greater than 30%. And then, uh, and then the word superfamily encompasses the distant relatives, uh, uh, but uh, which are having very uh, high similarity in their functions. The triphosphate isomerase function is completely different from aldolases. However, the fold is same um, because uh, there are not uh, infinite ways uh, to generate three-dimensional folds of proteins which satisfy all the uh, basic rules that like uh, the hydrophobic groups should be interior, hydrophilic groups should be exterior. You can't have wide volumes inside the protein and uh, all the polar groups should be involved in hydrogen bonding. These are too many conditions. So the number of folds are quite limited, okay? So, um, um, so we have been uh, uh, interested in, uh, um, uh, in, in the recognition of distant relationships so that we can add value to genomic data. We have, we have innumerable examples over the last 30 years. Uh, I'm showing just an example of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, when you go by what is generally available in the data bank information, all the data banks on TV put together out of, uh, you know, a little less than, uh, out of about uh, 4,000 4, gene products coded in the um, genome of TB, um, for 718, uh, nobody has any idea about the function. For the rest 3,300, there is some idea. But, uh, if you work hard enough using many sophisticated uh, developments, including the one that I'm going to talk now, then you can bring it down to 183. Uh, so uh, about uh, you know uh, more than 580 cases, we are able to identify the function. So I'm going to we have, we have been we have developed uh, something like at least four methods during the last 15 years 
to identify the distant relationships solely based on sequence information. And I'm going to uh, share only one of those four methods. The whole work was uh, inspired uh, by a paper published by my hero, Cyrus Chotia, uh, who passed away a few months ago. Uh, um, so he, he's the father of uh, protein bioinformatics, if you like. Um, he, uh, you know, his ideas are very simple, and even an elementary school children can understand that simple, but the impact is enormous. Here is a paper in 1997, this Park et al. is uh, from the group of Cyrus Chotia. He's an half Indian, by the way. Uh, his, uh, his father is a Parsi. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, all, that they, uh, all that they published in the Journal of Molecular Biology paper is that uh, if um, the sequence of protein A is similar to sequence of protein C, and if, if sequence of protein B is similar to pro protein C sequence, then A and B sequences should be similar. Although the sequence identity between them can be very, very poor. Um, in fact, uh, uh, sequence A and sequence C in, in the Cyrus's paper is greater than, it's about 70% sequence identity. And then the, this one, B and C is about 60%. But, but between A and B, uh, it's less than 20%. So um, it's a very simple idea. So, but it was very, very striking and very inspiring to me. Um, so um, I took this idea in a very literal sense and began implementing it in a, in a very uh, elaborate and in a brute force fashion. In order to understand the work that I'm going to describe, it will be uh, helpful to imagine some sort of a virtual sequence space in which uh, uh, every protein sequence is shown as dots, blue dots here. And then um, uh, the distance between the dots represent uh, the extent of sequence uh, identity between the sequences. So the closely spaced dots uh, come up with high sequence identity. Those yellow compartments you see are all protein families. Okay, and then the blue compartment uh, is, uh, includes many uh, proteins, uh, protein families, but all having the same fold. The fold is shown here. So uh, this is some sort of uh, the virtual sequence space I would like you to imagine. Um, now, uh, so uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, the whole, uh, the whole, the whole project uh, started many years ago when we developed a method called as cascade cyblas, which simply uses Cyrus Chotia's approach, but in a very elaborate and in a detailed fashion. Okay, um, so here is a, uh, uh, let's say this is a query protein family. You know, so one of the proteins in this family is a query. You want to identify the distant relatives. So um, what you do is using, using our approach, the cascaded approach, we use Cyblast, which is quite powerful by itself. I, I, I don't have time to tell here why Cyblast is very powerful, but I am always open in emails and I can, explain to you, it's all well documented uh, in many, uh, even in textbooks. Okay, um, so when you, when you take a query from the protein family uh, A, and then uh, with an objective of uh, finding the distant relatives, and you use Cyblast, given the power of Cyblast, you will pick up some distant relatives. These are distant relatives. And now, each one um, uh, can be queried now. And then, uh, you, you can uh, um, you, you can try and uh, uh, you, know, you can again use Cyblast for each one of these queries and find the homologs of the homologs. Okay, um, see the homolog of the homolog of the homolog is also the homolog of the original protein, right? See your relative's relative is also your relative, right? It is something like that. Okay, um, so uh, suppose you use Cyblast and then you get some something like say seven hits now. At the end of it, it goes in cycles. Very, very powerful method. So now you can fire seven Cyblast jobs with each one of these seven sequences as a queries. Suppose you get further five new hits. Now in the next generation, in the, sec, in the third generation of Cyblast, Cascade Cyblast, you can give those five sequences as queries. And you can ask, you know, what do you get? You can get further, you can keep going 
until you reach another family. So you may not be able to directly connect A and B families because the sequence identity is extremely poor. However, you can use so-called this intermediately related sequences, which is exactly the Cyrus Chotia's idea. And you can, you can, uh, you can have a, a facile walk in the sequence space, uh, hopping in the sequence space from, pro, from the family, from the cluster A to cluster B, using this, uh, all the hopping points, which are, all, which are all intermediately related. They don't belong to family A or family B, sort of intermediately related to either of the two families. And we have done it for large number of uh, uh, queries, and uh, otherwise I'm not going to be talking about it. Very successful. So, we, so when you when you query for motor proteins in the first generation, you get only these hits. Uh, and but if you if you give these proteins as queries, you get uh, in the uh, in the next generation, you get many more hits, and it it can you can keep growing the list of homologs until everything is exhausted. Um, all the homologs are picked up. Extremely powerful. We are very happy. We published papers and servers on these things. But sometimes, uh, I mean, this method depends on the availability of intermediately related sequences. What if you don't have any intermediately related sequence? You have here. So um, we, we got uh, um, sad about it. Uh, we, we can't, it can't be successful in all cases. Uh, if you don't have, so, you know, although the, although the sequences uh, are coming in very large numbers by the day, um, uh, you know, um, you have uh, uh, still in the sequence space, you have many void and sparse regions. So we wanted to, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, expand artificially uh, each of these families, uh, like, um, uh, you know, I will skip this slide. Okay, uh, some, somewhat like this. and. Uh, uh, and then you can you know reduce the sequence distance between uh, the two families, and then can we can check whether uh, whether now the cyblast can make it or not. So that improved artificial growth of protein. Family. I will just tell you very quickly um, how it works. Suppose this is a multiple sequence alignment of the protein family, and you want to design sequences, artificial sequences that that will uh, that will that will look like a member of this protein family. So you, this can be converted to position-specific scoring matrix, where you have 20 amino acids shown in, uh, um, in the first column, and then you have uh, uh, you have you know uh, um, uh, various alignment positions: one, two, three, four, five. It goes to whatever 250, 300, and then uh, these numbers are the representation of extent of occurrence of each of the 20 residues in in the various positions. Now, what you do is um, uh, you can generate. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, suppose you take the position number five, if you add all these numbers, which corresponds to extent of occurrence of each other 20 residues, you get, you know, 55. You imagine uh, a string of 55 centimeters length, and then you mark up three centimeters for alanine, two centimeters for arginine, etc., eight centimeters for leucine, uh, so that all 55 centimeters are taken into account. And then now you close your eyes and touch somewhere in the string. So you have a high chance of picking up leucine because that is occupying eight centimeters out of 50 centimeters. So that's what you actually do in order to generate uh, uh, your residue artificially in the alignment position five. You do that for each of these alignment positions. So, uh, you know, in the lottery, uh, in the Western countries, in the lottery uh, thing, you, they have a roulette wheel like this. So you can consider uh, uh, the roulette wheel for every alignment position. Alignment position one has a roulette wheel, two has a roulette wheel. And then in the alignment position one, the uh, extent of occurrence of each of the 20 residues is shown uh, as the shaded sectors here. And then you simply, uh, you have uh, as many uh, roulette wheels as the number of uh, alignment positions. And then uh, every, every roulette wheel you spin. Uh, and then you just uh, start writing down the residues that you get. So these are uh, uh, these are almost random sequences, but biased by the extent of occurrence of residues types in each of these uh, positions. Okay. Um, um, so uh, uh, now, um, um, all right. Uh, now, um, so you know, once we generate these sequences, um, now we we challenge these uh, offsprings. We call these as children here of the parent family. So we have from the uh, families, we use roulette wheels and then we generated lots of 
uh, biased random sequences. We challenge each one of these sequences using reverse blast into the position specific scoring matrices of all the protein families. Only those children which correctly pick up the parent in the reverse blast approach are considered as the bona fide design sequences. We, uh, we, have, uh, we have artificially populated uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, those families, uh, many families, and then uh, this is a dendrogram, which includes uh, uh, the natural protein sequences for a particular family, which are shown in some sort of this pista green. And then this grayish color ones uh, represent um, the artificial sequences. You can see the artificial sequences nicely link up uh, uh, the natural sequences. And uh, we, this was doing very well, lots of uh, homology uh, detections, which are not possible with the natural sequence database, uh, we could pick it up. But uh, this was going on well, but again, we had some problem. For some of the connections, uh, we are not able to pick up. And then we explored the dispersion of these artificial sequences, uh, which are used to populate the protein families. We have seen them uh, growing in the wrong direction. If it grows like this, um, it, it doesn't serve as all these new sequences, artificial sequences. They, they are not serving as linkers to connect with the related families. So, um, so again, uh, we were sad about it. So we then went on to, you know, whenever we face difficulty, we start a new project. So now we, we, we wanted to, uh, we started another project, which, which will be the modification of the algorithm of uh, uh, artificially populating a protein family by the natural, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, by, um, by exactly, uh, uh, you know, filling in sequences in the wild and sparse regions instead of, uncontrolled growth of uh, protein family, we wanted to generate in intermediate sequences. For example, family one here, family uh, three here, for example, and there is a void space between them. We wanted to generate sequences right here, not somewhere else, uh, uh, somewhere else which is useless to connect uh, with the family three. So uh, we wanted to build bridges, if you like, between the islands of protein families in the sequence space. So, um, uh, so this is the project which was, which was generated quite some time ago now, published in Journal of Molecular Biology, filling in wide and sparse regions in protein sequence space using protein-like artificial sequences. So now, um, this is a long story. You know, all this work evolved over a very long time with lots of failures. I'm only presenting an abstract of the whole work, uh, just you know, surfing through the success stories. Lots of other developments made in my group were, were all served as the backbone um, uh, in this uh, development, for example, uh, the database of aligned protein structures, Ali, which is the, the mentioned here. And then we have the hidden Marco, hidden Marco uh, matching programs developed by Krishna Dev. So all those scoring functions developed by Sandhya in published. So over time. So uh, now in this, um, uh, in, in the filling in void and sparse regions, um, we, we select two families which are called as parents. These are known to be related. And we wanted to generate artificial intermediately related sequences between the family one and two. So uh, it, it involves construction of uh, PSSMs and uh, HMMs for family one and two, making their alignment using some scores. Uh, um, again, we build a roulette wheel approach. Uh, say, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, but um, now this multiple sequence alignment and PSSM corresponds to the alignment from between two parents, two families. Previously, it was one parent. Now these are two parents. So that the sequences will lie intermediately related between the two sequences. So um, again, going back. Okay. So same old story, um, uh, but for uh, two uh, families, sequences of two families put together, we did the roulette wheel approach. Uh, now this, this one, uh, all these um, first generation um, artificial sequences should find the parents now, there are two parents, using the reverse blast approach. And then um, we got, uh, this are PC analysis uh, for the relationship between the artificial sequences and uh, natural sequences. Okay, now how, how far these uh, sequences are similar, artificial sequences are similar to the natural sequences? Actually, what I have not told you till now, in our algorithm, we have a handle. Uh, we can tell the algorithm that we want to generate an artificial sequence 
uh, that has only 10% sequence identity with any of the natural sequences corresponding to that protein family. Or we can say 60%. Uh, okay, we have a handle in that. Uh, in the handle that we chose to use, uh, that we call as level 5, uh, the sequence identity generally hovers around 45% with the natural sequence. But however, there are also sequences which go quite low um, uh, with the natural sequences. Okay, just a general idea. Uh, and um, so having done, um, having generated uh, uh, the, um, the, all the bridging sequences, intermediately related sequences between any two families, uh, we wanted to test it. So we have the uh, SCOP database, which gives you various protein folds, and every protein fold has various protein families. So we, 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 we have assumed the relationship between two families within the same fold. So, um, so we took two families at a time within the fold, and um, the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, um, the, nat uh, the, the natural sequence database contains about 3.6 million sequences to which we had added 4.7 um, million artificial sequences, making up to a larger sequence database. Uh, and then we wanted to ask the question whether the known relationships are picked up first. So uh, we took every protein of known structure uh, as documented in SCOP, and then we searched it using sequence, in, uh, using this, uh, using, um, uh, you know, the profile-based approach both in the natural sequence database and artificial sequence database. Okay, so everybody in the world searches only in the natural sequence databases. Uh, but we, we here argue that um, it will be useful to uh, include these strategically designed artificial sequences that will act as spy in the sequence uh, data bank. And then it will enable you using profile-based approach to connect up the natural sequences using artificial sequences as the intermediately related. So for example, for the ferritin-like fold query, if you had used the natural sequences, these are, uh, this, you know, the y-axis shows uh, the, uh, that is a percentage com coverage of the homologs. That's all you get. But in the case of argumented, argumented means argumented with artificial sequences, you get a lot more. Same thing for the beta to file fold, one of the notoriously uh, difficult protein families to find homologs. So, um, okay, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I mean, to cut the long story short, uh, it generally, uh, I mean, the sensitivity for the augmented database search is far better um, in most cases than the uh, uh, control database, which is the database of only the, uh, only the natural uh, sequences. And um, um, so, um, uh, Okay, so there are many, many new relationships that have been uh, picked up uh, using this. Uh, this is a seminar by itself. I will cut the long story short. Uh, but um, uh, now, you know, hang on a minute. Uh, am I cheating you here? See, uh, what I'm doing is, um, uh, okay, uh, this is a protein family. This is a related protein family. There are no intermediate sequences. Uh, but now I designed these sequences. Um, uh, I paved the road between these two uh, villages, if you like, uh, and then I'm able to drive my car. Previously, you are not able to go from here to here. Now we are going to go from here to here. What, what, what the heck is that? Because you have paved the road, so you are able to go. So I have now designed the sequences to lie intermediate between the two, and then, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then um, um, we are able to go from one family to another family. So uh, what, what is going on here? So actually, um, uh, you know, uh, although we try to generate artificial sequences to connect every two related families, our algorithm is so strict that it is not successful for all the pairs of protein families. There are certain protein families uh, like this, uh, the C-terminal domain of RPE32 and Lexate, uh, let's say repressor in terminal DNA binding domain, for between these two, we are not able to generate artificial sequences using our algorithm. We just let it go, that's all. So now, when you, when you give this as a query in the augmented database, and you don't expect this to get hit because there is no artificial uh, sequence that connects these two, right? However, surprise, surprise, when we gave query from RPA32 in the augmented database, it gave a hit from the let's say DNA binding domain. But if you give the same query in the natural sequence database, 
in uh, it is not able to pick up this the lexate but only when you generate when you only when you search in augmented database natural plus artificial you are able to pick it up although there is no designed sequence that connects these two how is it possible it was puzzling in the first sight for us then we realized that the c terminal domain rpa is also related to maria transcription regulator family and between these two families we are able to generate artificial sequences linker sequences between mar r and the lexa we are able to generate artificial sequences so our search procedure profile based search procedure first starting from c terminal domain of rpa as a query it it first uh, picked up mar a uh, proteins mar r proteins and then that could pick up the lexa proteins using these intermediate sequences so uh, you know uh, suppose uh, this is suppose you are driving your car every day from your house to your lab suppose uh, this is your house and this is your lab uh, one day due to the road repair uh, you are not able to drive so but you you will always take the diversion you can take the diversion you can you can you know drive one extra mile and still uh, you know reach your uh, uh, lab right so that's what the our profile based search is also doing although there are no uh, there is no road between these two we could build it, that is artificial sequences it uses other artificial sequences and linking families to somehow reach the destination so this was very impressive so there are many uh, examples of uh, uh, you know previously not able to gen uh, identify the relatives now we are able to identify and uh, i'm ju just in the last two or three minutes i will close it down um, by saying that um, there are many protein families which are referred as dufs that is domain of unknown function we have used this approach um, we have brought in the duff family uh, into the sequence space and we gave duff as the queries so almost something like see six more than 600 duffs are probably deduffed that is we are able to uh, find its uh, they are not uh, uh, they are not in the streets now we have found their families uh, okay Uh, they have their uh, they are in their own happy family now so which means that they are able we are able to recognize their structure and function uh, and this is one of the many examples of dufs uh, which we believe is a metalloenzyme given the conservation of critical residues or conservative substitution which are known to bind to some metal ions uh, this is just one of this more than 600 examples uh, I, uh, and all those conserved uh, all those functional residues should be conserved these are all this have to be ensured before you really predict the function so we we are, we, are, we have been continuously applying it uh, gayatri kumar in my group just graduated yes we've been applying it to recognize protein folds and functions from sequence information we have recent papers in biology direct and proteins i'll just flash uh, more than 1300 families of unknown structure there's no documentation in any database in the world that there is a structure but we, we are able to associate the structure uh, and that's documented in our paper in biology direct and recent very recently last month it was published in proteins uh, for many function assignment for orphan uh, protein families uh, this is just one of those examples which is a cat uh, family protein we believe it binds to ump uh, uracil monophosphate so many many more examples we have a server called enrichd uh, which will allow you to uh, search you in our artificial sequence natural artificial sequence database and also um, you can generate artificial sequences for the family of your interest using that um, so in 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 conclusion um, we have taken a rather unusual approach when in order to improve the homology detection for proteins everybody plays with gap penalty scoring functions you know the double dynamic programming and all that um, now we, we took a different approach here we manipulated the sequence database we just uh, uh, injected uh, some spice into the sequence database what we call as artificial sequences that will facilitate um uh, the recognition of uh, sequences um sequence relatives um from the sequence database which are otherwise not possible so this is this is a uh, this, this can be used in connection with blast fasta hhm uh, er or, or the jackhammer any program that's not the point here it's it is just a manipulation of the database that we have used here. and we believe uh, um, uh, it is extremely helpful in this uh, growing um, size of this black matter in the sequence uh, databases for, for which nothing uh, is known uh, for anybody in the world about what it does in the cell so i think programs such as the one i uh, 
I presented here uh, is uh, very, very helpful in these uh, situations. So um, this has been a contribution by several people. Uh, the Sandhya here at the center, top center, uh, she was a student of you know, Saudamini in NCBS, um, who happened to be my collaborator. Uh, and she, she developed she, uh, the, um, uh, the cascade approach and initial enriching the sequence family. Uh, and um, uh, she's currently a, a postdoc in my group. Uh, she's the backbone of the whole project. And uh, Richa Mudgal developed uh, um, uh, um, the sparse and void region, purposeful filling up. Uh, and, uh, and then the Gayatri Kumar uh, made extensive investigations on the, uh, uh, on, on the vitality of those sequences to recognize distant relatives and actually demonstrated by recognizing structures and functions of thousands of proteins for which uh, structure function information is not available. Uh, and uh, Snagar Kumar Chandra is our collaborator. Uh, in fact, uh, Richa Mudgal was a joint student of myself and Nagar Kumar Chandra. Uh, um, and there are a number of papers, uh, the details are there. I only presented the brief form. Uh, and I thank uh, many of the funding agencies, especially IAC DBT Partnership and my JC Bose Fellowship and the Mathematics Bi Mathematical Biology Initiative. Um, and thank you very much for your attention.